Good evening. Uh, I'll say at the beginning of this class, because the PowerPoint's not working, that if you don't have the sheet that's back there, this class will not make any sense to you. So you very much need, and uh, I've asked Terry T. Wendy to be the PPO. That means paper passer outer. Um, and so if you need the paper to be passed out to you, the PPO can do that. Uh, the reason that we need the material, especially tonight, is because we are looking at quotes from atheists uh, and philosophers to talk about our need for meaning, um, and, or I, I'm sorry, our need for identity. Uh, just from the last couple weeks, though, can anybody remind us uh, what some of the causes of skepticism are? Yeah, peer pressure is one of the causes of skepticism, that uh, if you're around a lot of people that believe different than you, you don't want to be the person that sticks out and looks weird for your beliefs. Uh, what's another cause of skepticism? Social media. What? Social media. Yeah, okay, yeah, social media, and that would be maybe contributing to uh, the, the peer pressure of what you see everybody else saying. What else? Yeah, bad religious experience. So you maybe you grew up in a hypocritical family, maybe you had a really bad experience at a local church, and you say that I'm done with religion altogether because all these people are uh, kind of crazy. Um, or just even a desire to sin, that there's some kind of sin that you want to commit, and rather than just saying, oh yeah, I want to commit such and such a sin, you want to come up with really sophisticated sounding reasons why you don't believe in God or the Bible, and that's the reason why um, you actually want to commit the sin that you're not going to say that you want to commit. Um, and so what's behind a lot of the big reasons for skepticism in our culture is not intellectual, rationalistic thinking. It's emotional reactions to a bad religious experience, um, emotional desire to justify committing some sin. Or, I don't want to seem weird around all of my peers, and so I'd like to just kind of cave to the pressure. And so, uh, if in our culture, one of the reasons why, the, really the underlying reason for, in my experience with people, about 90% of the time people are skeptic, it's because of an emotional reason. And so, if we're studying with people, and we're just giving them objective facts and data on why they should believe, are we really meeting them where they're at? No. Uh, we've got to show the emotional appeals of Christianity. So last week, Matt talked about uh, how Jesus gives us meaning better than the secular worldview can. So what we're doing right now is we're talking about different human needs and how the biblical worldview best is suited to give us the need that we have. So tonight we're talking about our need for identity. Everybody, whether you're a Christian or an atheist, uh, Buddhist, Islam, whatever, everybody needs to have a sense of identity. So the first question on the sheet is what does it mean to have a sense of identity? Yeah. To know who you are. Yeah, to know who you are, it's self-understanding. What? How else could we describe what a sense of identity is? Yeah. Yeah, you feel it belonging with a certain group of people, perhaps. Like, these are my people, and this kind of shapes what I believe about things. Um, I, another way you can think about identity is that uh, all of us have different hats that we wear. Uh, some of us are fathers, but we're also husbands. And we're also brothers to our siblings. And we're children to our parents. And we've got jobs that we go to. So with all the different hats that we wear... Uh, you might act a little different in these different scenarios. That doesn't necessarily make you a hypocrite. Uh, the, your sense of identity is whatever would be identical about you, though. The core thing that's true about you in all of those scenarios you might be in. So your identity is the deepest things within you that are true about you. And so everybody needs to have a sense of self-understanding. Uh, I remember when I was growing up, people talked a lot about, I'm trying to discover who I am. Do people talk that way anymore? Or do people talk in different terms now? 
Okay, yeah, trying to find my authentic self. And the way that in our culture, well, I'll wait before we get to that because we'll, we'll piggyback on that. But is everybody good on what we mean when we say identity, the core truth about you, that sort of thing? So um, we're going to talk about two secular approaches to building a sense of identity. Um, Carl Truman uh, teaches at some seminary, I think, in Pennsylvania. Um, and he uh, wrote a book called The Rise and the Triumph of the Modern Self, and he describes the traditional and the modern approach to understanding yourself. So look at this first quote here uh, under the traditional approach. Culture, at least historically, directs the individual outward. It is in communal activities that individuals find their true selves. The true self in traditional cultures is therefore something that is given and learned, not something the individual creates for himself. All right, how would you describe from that what a, a traditional sense of identity is? You do what society thinks you should do. Yeah, you do what society thinks you should do. So for example, if you grew up in the 1500s and um, dad was a silversmith, what should you be? You should be a silversmith. But what if you really, really want to be an artist? What would that culture tell you, generally? Don't worry about it. Be a silversmith. Yeah, stuff it and just be uh, a silversmith. And so, like, you, your sense of what you do and who you are is given to you from the outside. And now, I'm not, I'm not bringing up the traditional approach because I'm defending it. What I'm doing is I'm saying that I, there's a shift that's happened in our culture. There's good things and bad things about the traditional and the modern approach. And the Bible's going to put the best of both of those things together. But that's, that's uh, let's, go, let's shift to the modern approach, and then we'll say more about contrasting them. So the, the modern approach, Carl Truman says... Psychological categories and an inward focus are the hallmarks of being a modern person. This is what, and he's quoting Charles Taylor, refers to as expressive individualism, that each one of us finds our meaning by giving expression to our own feelings and desires. All right, what is the, the more modern approach to understanding yourself? The traditional one is you work from the outside and you make your desires fit what everybody expects of you. What's the modern approach? Finding your truth. Yeah, you find your own truth, and then you all better praise it and accept it and celebrate it, and we're going to have parades that better tell you that you all better be okay with it, because I'm being true to myself, and I'm done trying to toe the line of what everybody wants of me. Um, and he brings up in this quote, psychological categories. Um, it's been interesting to me that in colleges, what's become more common now is to take psychology classes and it's less common to take philosophy classes. Psychology classes are all about understanding yourself and, and um, there's a lot to say about, you know, I think there's, there's value in thinking about some of these kinds of things. But people are told, you gotta be true to yourself, you gotta be true to yourself, you be what you feel like is true for you and these two approaches, I have some quotes from the um, really deep philo philosophical work called Frozen, the movie. Um, so, you know, remember when Elsa, is, is she singing and everything? And uh, the traditional approach, she says, don't let them in, don't let them see, be the good girl you always have to be. Conceal, don't feel, don't let them know. What is she, what's going through uh, Elsa's mind in that part of the song? Yeah, she's conforming to what people expect of her. She's got these powers to do ice things or something that she knows that she's supposed to like not let other people know about. Um, and then the song gets really happy and it's all joyous and stuff. And then she says, well, now they know, let it go, let it go, can't hold it back anymore. Uh, let it go, let it go, turn away and slam the door. I don't care what they're going to say. What happens in the song? Your perspective changes where I'm done stuffing my desires into, and doing what you all tell me to do. And now you all have to be okay with who I am. And I'm, if that means I have to leave you guys, then I'll go ahead and leave you guys. But I'm not going to do what you guys tell me to do anymore. Have you noticed, by the way, how many movies in our culture, especially done by Disney, by the way, 
um, have that kind of idea in their movies. Mom and dad don't know anything that's wise, and I'm going to go ahead and reject everything they have to say, and I'm going to do things my own way. Look for it in our cultural art, because our cultural art is, is programming us. By the way, have you ever wondered why it's called, what, what's on the uh, TV programming tonight? Because it's programming you. Or television, it's telling a vision, and it's giving you ideas of how to think about things, but it's in an entertaining way, so on and so forth. It, it's, uh, that's all very interesting stuff. Um, but that is all thrown right in front of us in our culture right now. All right? Any comments on or questions or clarifications on the traditional versus the modern approach to building a sense of identity? So traditional approach, culture tells you what to do, your identity is handed to you. Modern approach, I discover myself and then all of you better be okay with it. Alright, so what we're about to critique is the modern approach because that's what our culture is living in, in a sense. So let's go to the other side of the paper, and let's start thinking about some of the weaknesses of the modern approach. And remember, the reason that we're doing this is because we're trying to help people see and challenge all of us to ask ourselves, if this is the way I'm trying to understand my sense of identity, this would suggest that I am swallowing a lot of what our culture is telling me to do. What are the weaknesses of this, and how does the Bible give us a better sense of all of these things? So, here's the first weakness to the modern approach. Number one, it's self-contradictory. Um, before I read, the, well, let me go ahead and read this quote from Steve Stosny. He's a psychologist. He says, the drive to be autonomous, able to decide our own thoughts, feelings, and behavior, must compete with an equally strong drive to connect to others. We want to be free and independent without feeling controlled. At the same time, we want to rely on significant others and have them rely on us for support and cooperation. All right, um, what, he's, what is he saying here? What's his basic point in this quote? Yes, it's, so, it's contradictory. I mean, um, do, do people ever have two desires that are actually in conflict with one another? So how about somebody tells you, you be true to yourself, be true to yourself. And you're like, ah, uh, I don't even understand myself very well. In this example, he brings up our, our desire to be autonomous. I want to kind of do things my own way. But at the same time, we have a desire to have intimacy and fellowship with people. And um, uh, if you have this drive to be autonomous, but then you end up getting married, let's say, does some of your autonomy have to die for you to have a good marriage? Yeah, so you've got two conflicting desires. So somebody tells you, hey, you gotta be true to yourself. Well, I don't even know what that means. How do I do that? Can you think of other desires people might have that are contradictory to one another at times? Yeah, so you got like you you want to commit some kind of crime, but at the same time you don't want to get arrested. So and then you're being told you be true to yourself. Be true. Well, I don't know. Like, uh, depending on what day it is, or what time of the week, or or what time of the day, or you know whatever. Uh, then it might be this or it might be that. I don't know. Um, I got a text on Sunday from somebody um, whose granddaughter has become transgender, and um, for for transgenderism, this is very much. This is what I feel, and all of you better be okay with it. And um, the, he had sent me the text message that had been shared. And um, one of the things that, that happens with this is people come up with the term gender fluidity, which means that maybe around 3 o'clock I feel like this gender, and maybe at 6 o'clock I feel like that gender. So we have to come up with this term gender fluidity because I might keep going from one thing to another to another. And the kind of psychology that these people are getting inundated with is just bringing all kinds of harm to their own life. But they think they're being liberated. 
Here's another thing that could uh, be in contradictory with each other. Uh, let's say that I want to be really successful in my career, but I also want to be a really good family man. Can those things always coexist really well together? No. How about this? I, I kind of feel like not working very hard, but at the same time, I want to have financial independence. So can you imagine, like, all of us are, like, walking civil wars with our opposing desires, and then our culture says, be true to yourself, be true to yourself, be true to yourself. It, how helpful is that? Well, what self am I true to? So that's the first problem with this. It's self-contradictory. Do you guys have any thoughts or questions about that first problem with this? Does that, all, does that make sense so far? All right, here's another problem with this modern approach, is that it's very fragile. Look at this. Ernest Becker wrote a book in the 60s, I think it was, about how culture is going to deal with getting rid of God, the idea of God and our need for God. So look what he says here. What is it that we want when we elevate the love partner to the position of God? We want redemption, nothing less. We want to be rid of our faults, of our feelings, of nothingness. We want to be justified, to know that our creation has not been in vain. We turn to the love partner for the experience of the heroic, for perfect validation. We expect them to make us good through love. Needless to say, human partners can't do this. The lover does not dispense cosmic heroism. He cannot give absolution in his own name. The reason is that it, as a finite being, he too is doomed, and we read that doom in his own fallibilities, in his very deterioration. Redemption can only come from outside the individual, from beyond. So he, he's saying here that if you get rid of the idea of God validating you, and you start to get a sense of what the biblical picture of this is going to be from that quote, um, that you say, okay, um, I'm just going to be true to myself, and I'm going to get rid of the idea of God and everything like that. Who do you still end up needing that validation from? From others, and especially your love partner, whoever your husband or wife might be, or romance person or whatever. And um, because what ends up happening is if I'm just going to be true to myself and you all better stuff it, and I don't care what you have to say, do you actually care what other people have to say? That's built into who we are. Were we built to need glory? Yes. Our problem is that we look for glory from other people and not from God. But let's say, for instance, that's, that, let's say that some, there's somebody that's an artist. Uh, when, I, when I was in Arkansas, when we were in Arkansas this last week, we went to the Crystal Bridges um, Art Museum, which is one of the most famous art museums in all the world. Um, and we saw some of the modern art. And by the way, let me just do a little side tangent for a second. Have you guys noticed that modern art, if you look at modern art, it doesn't make sense to you? Do you know what modern art is trying to do? So like, let's say that somebody experienced bad childhood abuse or something like that. And then they take a canvas and they throw a bunch of paint colors on it because to them, it reminds them of their trauma and how nothing made sense growing up. And here's how I'm going to express that to you. And so, but to the person that's looking at it, they don't, they can't know what all of that did for the original person that made it, but it's supposed to bring things out of you. What did art used to be like? Look at this sunset. Look at these mountains. Look at these birds on a tree. Um, so, more older art was, look at these objective things outside of you. Modern art, like, doesn't even make sense. Because it's all psychological. So, um, well, let's just say for a moment that somebody had made some art, and every person that looks at it goes, that's terrible, I don't understand it, I think you're a terrible artist. Do you think that they're going to keep going, well, uh, I don't care what you have to say, I only care what I think about me. If nobody ever praised it, do you think they'd be okay with that? No, you inevitably need something to praise it. And because you've taken God out of the picture, what you need to praise it are those who are closest to you. And the reason why you know that that's not enough is you see those people passing away. Those people are deteriorating. Those people aren't going to give you perfect validation all the time. They're going to critique you at times. And so if you need other people to end up praising your own decisions, it's part of the text message that I got from a couple days ago was if you guys as my family members um, 
do not affirm what I'm doing, I will, not, I will no longer be having communication with you. Uh, why? Because your worldview is fragile. Because your worldview demands that everybody accept you, and if you're not going to, in a cult-like kind of way, I will not talk to you again. I, I, I have a friend that was, uh, his last name, uh, well, I'm not going to say it, actually. Uh, but his locker was right next to mine from 7th grade through 12th grade, because our last names were pretty similar. And so um, we, we got to know each other and everything. So a, a couple years after I graduated uh, high school, he became transgender. And we continue talking from time to time. I call him now probably every six months or so. And he, he transitioned from being a guy to trying to be like a girl. And then his daughters were confused. His wife was very upset. And he eventually hit rock bottom and transitioned back. And so I've called him several times to just ask him what his experience was like, what happened. And, and one of the things that he said was, that I, I was told to block out anybody who would disagree with me. Um, do you know what people call like those who struggle with depression because they are not accepted by society or they feel like people are going to reject them is minority stress. Have you guys ever heard that term? You know, like I'm in the minority of people because I'm transgender and I get all kinds of flack because of that. And that's why I struggle with suicidal thoughts. And that's why I struggle with depression because people don't accept me. Do you think Christians in the first century that were being martyred and persecuted and rejected struggled with depression and suicide? I don't think so. And so maybe there's a difference in the worldview that the Christian has got something that even when they're being rejected and persecuted, they can think about their opposition in a completely different way. Now, so do you see that this, this worldview of saying, I'm gonna be true to myself, it ends up making you very fragile because one criticism sets you off and you can't be happy and you've got to reject all of those people and you can't even live in a normal life because you need safe places and all this kind of thing. Any comments or questions on the fragility that this worldview gives you? Does that make sense? We tracking? All right, let me ask this, uh, oh, let me do this other one. Okay, the third problem with this modern approach that you've got to be true to yourself is that it really just reverts back to a traditional approach. It's just a traditional approach in disguise. Um, let me, uh, uh, okay. Uh, so Samantha, I'm going to use Samantha as an example, and I'm not saying that she thinks everybody needs to be this way. Do we all understand that before I say what I'm going to say? Okay, so before Samantha and I were married, and we were getting closer to being married, she always just wanted to be a stay-at-home wife and have a bunch of kids and take care of the kids. That's been her dream. So, do you think Samantha would be praised and encouraged in our society that she's being true to herself? No. In fact, people would still try to make her convinced that she's still under some kind of patriarchy, and you really just need to be true to yourself. And what that means is that you need to actually be successful and do something that matters in the world. Like, not raise kids with you know, snot running down their noses and changing diapers, like that kind of stuff doesn't even matter. But if Samantha's like, well, no, this is kind of what I've always really wanted to do, well, suddenly there's something wrong with her in our society. Society's not going to praise the Christian for being true to himself or herself. So do you see that even when society says, be true to yourself, be true to yourself, it's in a hypocritical way. It's be true to yourself in these specific areas that we're telling you to be. Ergo, your worldview, our worldview in this culture, is still outside in. You better do one of these things that we want you to do, and we'll call you brave for doing that. Comments or questions on that? Yeah, Brian? So basically, you just end up rewriting the definition of, of traditional. Yes. Because if enough people are pushing a, a certain narrative, and that starts to become the mainstream idea, then that is your tradition that's being destroyed. Right. Good. Good. So being true to yourself is still a cultural demand. Um, any, anything else you guys want to say about how it ends up being an illusion? Um, all right, 
any other problems that you guys can think of with this modern approach? Yes. Yeah, and my friend that um, that transitioned and then detransitioned, he told me that for him, his his journey to being open to all of this was first of all to try to figure out if he thought homosexuality was okay with the Bible, and he he had a lot of false views of the Bible and everything, and he was like, okay, well, in his view, homosexuality is okay with the Bible. And then in his, the, he's just telling me what his thought process was. In his mind, not everybody would make this leap, but in his mind, that then meant that something like transgenderism might be true. So his psychologists were a bunch of YouTube channels. So he went from one YouTube channel to another. That made him start thinking, you know what? I have kind of wondered before what it would be like to be a woman. And maybe, maybe that does mean that I've been misgendered my whole life. And then he started going, and, and all these videos were telling him all these things that he should be thinking, and, and, uh, and then he ended up being true to himself, which was really beliefs that were assigned to him based on these things he was watching. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and it did not work out for them. Yeah. Any other comments on this so far? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, think, think of it like this. Um, let's say that, that somebody could, has recorded, let's say that you're a secular person, you don't believe in the ethics of God, and somebody has recorded every single time you've been frustrated by somebody else. Somebody, somebody cut me off in the road. Somebody lied to me. Somebody gave me a bad deal on that thing that I bought. And so you, you have all these things that, that are obviously your standards. And then they took your standard and held it against you. How would you measure up to your own standard? Do you think you'd be okay? No. So this idea of self-validating or me telling myself that I only care what I think about myself, you don't even live up to your own standards. So that this approach is never, ever going to work. Yeah. There is no standard. There is, yeah. Right. There's no objective standard. And so you wonder then, why is it in our culture that so many people don't understand themselves? And, and there's, the more our culture has focused on their emotions and their psychology and how they feel about everything, do you think we've gotten happier or less happy? Probably a lot less happy. Like there, there's probably a degree to which you shouldn't just even think about your emotions too much and just do what you're supposed to do and learn to suck it up and, and do hard things. But in our culture right now, psychological categories and how you feel about everything is what matters so much. And there's some good books being written by this now. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And you can start to see then, why is there so much mental health in our mental health problems in our society right now? It, it's because of the world, a lot of it, I don't want to be reductionistic, but a lot of it is because of this way of looking at the world that's been assigned to us since the Enlightenment. Everything that matters is how you feel. Um, all right, let's look at the biblical approach. So, if our culture has created a mess on how people understand themselves, 
what is the biblical approach? Now, um, I got a couple passages to think about with this. Um, in 1 Corinthians 4, I'll read these two verses in just a moment. Probably the most succinct verses that I can, I can think of, at least, in the Bible that deals with how you should understand yourself. The context of 1 Corinthians 4 is that in the first four chapters of 1 Corinthians, what's the problem in the church? Division. I follow Paul, I follow Cephas, I follow Christ, and there's all these different people that are carving up their favorite teachers, um, and it's going beyond just preferences, but they're actually dividing the church over it. And so what Paul does is he brings up the Greek word soukakos, which is the word for psychology, and if you want a great text of scripture that helps you understand how to understand yourself, 1 Corinthians 1-4 through is one of the best passages in the Bible for it. And so what he's doing is he's trying to help the Corinthians understand, hey guys, this is how I understand myself, and I'm one of the people you guys are dividing over. Learn to adopt the way of thinking that I have. So look at 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. All right. What does Paul say about his thoughts on how other people think about him? It's not part of the equation. Yeah, it's, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you. Does that, when he says it's a small thing, does that mean it might bother him a little bit? Maybe, maybe? but it sure doesn't feel like that's like the, the emphasis of the passage. It's a small thing that I'd be judged by you. And now, people, okay, so Paul, he's going, I don't care what you think about me, and you might think that he would swing it the other way and go, I only care what I think about me. But is he saying that in this passage? No, what, what, how do we know? I don't judge myself. Now, he says in verse 4, I'm not aware of anything against myself. In other words, what he's saying there is, there's nothing that's breaking my conscience that I'm aware of that I've done. So my conscience is clean right now. But even then, that doesn't make me acquitted. That doesn't make me innocent. Can your conscience feel good, but you not even realize that before God, you're a sinner? Yeah. Um, and so uh, he, what, who is he saying he cares about what they think about him? I don't care what you think about me. I don't even care what I think about me. I care about what? What the Lord says about me. Um, what is it that the Lord says about Christians? What you think about God is one of the most important things about you. If your view of God is that he's always waiting for you to make a mistake so he can whack you across the face, and then you're in salvation, out of salvation, in salvation, out of salvation, just back and forth, back and forth all the time, do you think that, like, to go, you know, I don't care what you think about me, I don't care what I think about me, I only care what the Lord thinks about me, and, I, and the Lord kind of seems bipolar. Do you think you're going to feel pretty good then? Let me show you something that I think is valuable. Go to the book of Ephesians. This is something that I oftentimes like to show new converts, is I encourage them um, to get a highlighter. And to highlight these titles, when I preached through Ephesians like a couple years ago, um, I had pointed this out several times. But the first three chapters of Ephesians tells you all the things that God thinks about you if you're a Christian. And so in uh, verse 1 of chapter 1, you're a saint. In verse 4, you are chosen. In verse 5, you are adopted. In verse 7, you are redeemed. In verse 7, also, you are forgiven. In verse 18, you are made God's glorious inheritance. In chapter 2, verse 4, you are loved. In chapter 2, verse 5, you are alive and saved. In verse 10, you are God's workmanship, which the Greek word there means poem. What is a poem, by the way? It's art put to words. How did God create the world? What did he keep doing in Genesis 1? He kept speaking. He, there's a sense in which the, the world itself is, is, a po is poetry. He spoke it into existence. It's a beautiful thing that he made. And that's the same word that is used in Romans 1 to talk about the creation that he made. You are also his spoken word made to, made to be art because his words are making you beautiful is the idea there. 
In chapter 2, verse 16, you're reconciled. In chapter 2, verse 21, you're his holy temple. In chapter 3, verse 16, you are strengthened. I have all of those words highlighted in my Bible. And one of the things, because we can, we can struggle with, I care what people think about me. I, no, 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 I, only, I, you know, I care what I think about me. No, 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 stop it. The things that we need to wash through our brain when we're struggling with moments like that is no, if I'm in Christ, I'm a saint, I'm chosen, I'm adopted, I'm redeemed. Re like, repeat those things to yourself. Preach those things to yourself. We care about what the Lord thinks about us, which means that the world might call me narrow-minded and bigoted and uh, brainwashed or whatever, and it's not going to hurt me too much because I have the praise of God. So why am I concerned what the world says about me? You see how the biblical approach, we all need praise from the outside. Our problem is that we look for it from people and not the Lord. Now, Christians should encourage one another, and that should mean something to us, but we should still ultimately be okay if we never got any praise from people because we know that the Lord has affirmed us. All right, so any comments or questions on what Paul says there? Have you ever been praised before by somebody you didn't respect? Uh, if you've had that happen, how much did it mean to you? Didn't really matter. What if somebody you really, really idolize and respect praises you? What does it mean to you? A lot. What if God, who created the world, has called you all these things? Um, shouldn't that give us quite a bit of strength? to not be so consumed with what people think about us. And, and it should also cause us to go, I don't even care what I think about me. So you see how the biblical approach to understanding yourself like cuts through the modern and the traditional approach. But there's one other thing to say about this. Anything else you guys want to say before we move on now? Yeah, John? Yes. Good. So do, do you see how the Bible takes the best of the traditional approach and it does assign something to you? This is what God says about you. But doesn't part of you still want to have some individuality like what the modern approach says? I think all of us want to feel like we're an individual. So the Bible also recognizes that as well, but makes it sanctified and gives us guardrails for how we do that. Um, for example, 1 Corinthians 12, 27, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So if all Christians are saints, chosen, adopted, redeemed, forgiven, God, so that's true about all of us. I want, some, I want something that's unique about me. Um, well, you're all part of the body of Christ, but you're individually members of it. So each one of us has a different set of gifts and talents that we can use to serve the Lord with. So the, and that is something that you have to look within and figure out, what am I good at? What can I do for the Lord? But it's given with the guardrails of not doing what we do in our culture today. So we looked at this passage even a few weeks ago in our church classes, but Romans 12, verses 6 through 8. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them of prophecy in proportion to our faith. If service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who, who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Uh, so Paul lists out seven gifts or so there that, uh, that you've got to figure out. What way are you going to serve the Lord? How does your age help you? Do you have more strength because you're younger and more energy? Are you older and you've got more wisdom to share with other people? How much time do you have during the week? What things are you good at? And you do get to try to discover those things, but it's not in the modern psychological kind of way. You're given a task to do, and you do it. Brian? Right? 
Right. Yes, and that's what our culture would say to do with it. Right. And, and um, if you want to feel good, then just do what's right. Just be active doing the right thing. And you'll, you're not going to feel good by constantly thinking about your emotions. You're going to feel good by buckling down and doing the right thing. Any other thoughts or comments on any of this? And b barring, you know, there's exceptions of deep mental health problems. I understand the exceptions, but I'm not speaking to the exceptions right now. Any other comments or questions about this so far? All right, how would you guys describe the traditional approach to understanding your identity? Yeah. Uh, what the collective says about you, it's outside in. How would you, under, well, how would you guys describe what the, the modern approach to identity is? Inside out. Um, and so we live in an inside out sort of culture. It's all over the place in our art, in our movies, whatever. And, it's, and I think this is, again, one of the reasons why so many people have so many deep problems. Do, do you think that people, just as a thought experiment, do you think people in, let's say, um, Nigeria or Sierra Leone, Africa, some of the poorest areas of the world, do you think they get up every morning going, you know what, I, I just don't know what gender I am? Have you ever thought before that people that are in poorer countries have better mental health than people who are in really rich countries and have more mental health problems? Now, some people would say, well, it's because they have more psychologists and therapists that can tell them what their problems are and that sort of thing. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that that would be the only reason for that. Uh, I think they're fighting for survival and they're wondering where their next meal is going to be. They don't have the luxuries to worry about what gender they might be. Um, and so, uh, so our society, because we've got all, all this time on our hands and all these luxuries, we've got all this time to just think about my psychology and my feelings all day long. And what we need to do is we need to get busy embracing what God has called us and get busy doing the, Lord, the work that the Lord has given to us. And I think a lot of those things will just kind of fade and be okay then. Any other final thoughts or comments on any of this? Yeah. Oh. Arm wrestle. <laughs> I feel like the, the idea... Yes. Yep. Uh, I think our, our um, society likes to try to provide this crisis that may not necessarily be there if that is your compass. If you have a compass. Yes. Um, that's not made by you yourself. Right. Good. Good. Gavin? All the other rules. All the other rules. So where, where do you approach that? We're going to talk about, I think, morality next week. Yeah, next week we're talking about morality, and that'll be a lot of the discussion. Um, we're about done with class tonight. We have two more classes that are going to be philosophical like this, okay? And then the rest of this quarter is going to be traditional evidences on why we believe in God. But I, the reason that we're doing these classes first is we're trying to help people realize that their way of looking at the world is, is, is crushing them. And then that opens them up to seeing the traditional evidences. So that's what we're doing in these classes. So Lord willing, next week the PowerPoint will be working and we're gonna look at our need for morality. And more specifically what I mean by that is our need to have a reason to care about morality. I think atheists can do a lot of things that, that seem morally upright. And we'll talk about those kinds of things next week. Thank you for the good discussion.